the only way he could release all of the details of the third secret was if he had been released by the reigning pontiff of the time to do so. Robert Morrow Jr., he is someone who was a close personal friend to Maliki Martin. And Maliki Martin remains a great man of mystery, of intrigue, and uh, some would even uh, say scandal. But I find him very, very fascinating. Can we start by getting to know Father Maliki Martin a little bit? He was very unassuming, but he was also the kind of person who could, who could put you at ease extremely quickly. Once you'd been talking to him for 10, 15 minutes... He was one of those rare people who made you feel like you'd known him for 15 years. He was, he was just very, very friendly. There was no putting on of airs. Actually, he was more interested in getting to know you than talking about himself. Let's talk about some of the myths and misconceptions. This is a guy who uh, some say was defrocked, but still acted like a priest inappropriately. What, what would you say to that? What would be your response to those accusations? Well, without giving away too much of what's going to be in the book, I can confirm that he was not just a priest, that Father Martin was actually, back in the 1950s, Father Martin had been consecrated a bishop by Pope Pius XII in the late 1950s. And that was due to some of the very confidential work he had to conduct for the Holy See. And we have to keep in mind that back in the 1950s, although the seeds of modernist heresy were beginning to sprout, not only in the church at large, but within the various religious orders, by and large, the Jesuit order at that time was still considered to be very orthodoxly loyal to uh, the Pope of Rome and the magisterial teachings. There was no great you know, levels of dissent the way we hear today. You know, he claimed to have read The Third Secret of Fatima. I always wondered why he mm -hmm. never revealed that. Uh, I, you know, uh, listening to his radio interviews, he'd be like, oh, that sounds similar. But, you know, like, but he wouldn't say for sure. Was he under, was he under a Vatican seal to, and uh, prevented from releasing that publicly? He had taken what he referred to me as the, uh, the oath of pontifical secrecy. He was permitted to read, a trans, a, at the time, a German translation because he worked for German Jesuit Cardinal Bea. He was permitted to read a German translation of that in 1960 on the conditions that he take the pontifical oath of secrecy that the only way he could release or speak all of the details of the third secret was if he had been released by the reigning pontiff of the time to do so. Maliki Martin mentioned that there was a secret ceremony at the Vatican to enthrone Satan. Is that something you're going to be writing about in your book at all? What I'm going to be doing is kind of tick and tying it to the various events that have officially taken place in the Vatican over the past uh, three or four years in which uh, pagan deities have been officially worshipped in the Vatican and the Vatican Gardens. And I'm not going to say the name, because to say the name gives the deity power. One of the things you're going to learn about him is uh, his extensive work behind the Iron Curtain during the 1950s, when Nikita Khrushchev was premier of the Soviet Union and head of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Many people are under the illusion that religious persecution in the Soviet Union was at its worst under Joseph Stalin. And it actually ramped up by an order of magnitude under his successor, Nikita Khrushchev. And along, again, along with proof, uh, you know, the old, the, the saying now, pictures or it didn't happen. And I have, I have the pictures uh, to prove that he did indeed engage with United States and British intelligence and in work behind the Iron Curtain. You know, at, at his core, he was a priest of Jesus Christ, and he was a very loyal and devoted priest of Jesus Christ. Uh, hmm. He was devoted to our Lord through his mother uh, under the title Our Lady of the Rosary or Our Lady of Fatima. He kind of used them interchangeably. And that's what the book will bring about, as well as clearing up a lot of the, uh, the calumny, slander, and outright lies against him. Because although he was not a prophet, 
as you pointed out earlier, he had a very keen geopolitical sense mm. and of the intersection between geopolitics and religion. And that's why the title of, uh, you know, Against the Scream of the Approaching Ancient Beast, uh, it's not the ancient beast as Lucifer in an exorcism, but it's the approach of the ancient beast as in Lucifer's overall takeover since the 1950s of Western culture and his attack on the Roman Catholic Church as well across a broad spectrum of areas. Now, he's buried, uh, and next to him is a woman. That's caused quite a bit of uh, talk and scandal about Father Malachi Martin as well. Can you speak to that? Father Martin predeceded Mrs. Lovanos, and she was his basically his landlord because he lived in a small separate apartment within their uh, the floor they owned at 116 East 63rd Street. He predeceded her by six years. She passed away, I believe, in 2005. He died in 1999. When he died, he had no way to influence where Mrs. Lovanos was going to be buried. Mm. So if she decided she was going to be buried in an adjacent plot to his, it's not like he was going to object to it. Yeah. He had no choice yeah. in the matter. I was going to say it's important to no, clear up the fact that this this lady was his landlord, but really his sponsor made it possible for him to focus on what he was doing without having to worry about, you know, where to live and 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 paying the rent and all of that. Exactly, because until he got his footing as an author through the Guggenheim Fellowships, um, you know, he held you know basically what we would consider menial jobs. He cleaned out grease traps in a Greenwich Village donut shop by day, wow. and by night he drove a cab. He was convinced in the veracity of Fatima, and he was convinced that Fatima held the key to uh, our success, uh, rise and fall of Western civilization. He believed in Garabandal very fervently because he said it was a continuation of Fatima. Wow, powerful. Robert Maher Jr., we're out of time, but I'm grateful for your insight into demystifying Father Maliki Martin, and I'm gonna pray for your book project to come to fruition. If anybody wants to support him in this project, we're going to put a link to his Gibson Go campaign in our show notes today. But it's gibsongo.com forward slash Maliki underscore Martin underscore book. Again, we'll put a link to it in our show notes. But uh, wouldn't you want to know more? Well, the book project may be a way to get to that. Again, look for the show notes after we go off the air. Robert Morrow Jr., God love you. God bless you. Thank you again. Did you like that video? It's okay. You can admit it. It's perfectly fine. Hey, we cover the big stories of our day from inside the church to outside the church to all points in between. And we do it from a Catholic perspective. It's called a Catholic take. It's a radio program Monday through Friday. We live stream it right here on this channel, by the way. So make sure to subscribe, like, and share. We would be very grateful to you. And don't forget, you're going to want to watch this video right here because you don't want to miss anything.